Welcome to the Reading is Fundamentals webinar on supporting literacy development at home during COVID-19. A few housekeeping points before we get started today. Everyone is muted for the presentation. If you have any questions, please direct them into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We will be answering as many of the questions as we can at the end during the Q&A. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and we will make a link with the recording available to all of you after the broadcast, as well as a copy of this presentation. We are thrilled to have you join us today. My name is Katie Nicholson and I am on RISC community team. I'll take just a few brief minutes to orient you all to reading is fundamental. RIF has been committed to children's literacy for over 50 years. Our mission consistently has been to get books and reading resources into the hands of children who need them most, whether that is through print or digital mechanisms. This mission has never been as important as it is today as we strive to ensure children continue to read and develop while they are at home. RIF has created a number of resources to support reading engagement during this time, and I'll share a, website, um, a few websites for all of you to review at the end of this webinar. I would now like to introduce you to Erin Bailey, our guest literacy expert. Erin is a doctoral candidate at the George Washington University with research interests in art and museum literacies. She is currently a literacy specialist at Inspired Teaching Demonstration School and serves as a supervisor for literacy specialist interns. Erin is also an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at George Washington University. She is very passionate about helping children learn to read and deepening their love for reading. We are pleased to have Erin join us today, and I'll now turn the time over to her for the remainder of the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Katie, and thank you, Reading is Fundamental, for having me today. Before we get into the content today, I want to say thank you to all the healthcare workers and essential workers um, who are doing their jobs during this time. I also want to say thank you to everyone who is attending today. Um, when we think about the special populations that are impacted by COVID-19, we have to keep in mind one of our most special populations, and that is our children. They are our future, and they are affected by school closures right now. So thank you for each of you for coming today. If you're able to implement just one or two of the activities that I show you today, you're doing your part and taking steps towards supporting your children's literacy during this pandemic. Um, so what we'll cover today, we will go over phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. We'll review alphabetic principle and phonics. We'll talk about sight words and high frequency words, fluency, vocabulary acquisition. We'll go over comprehension of both informational text and literature text. Uh, at the end, we'll share some reading as fundamental resources and have a question and answer. And the great thing about today is all of these activities are low tech or use household items and they can be used for all ages. So to begin, phonological awareness mostly applies to pre-K students through first grade. So you're thinking ages three through about six. And phonological awareness refers is a broader term that refers to language, word, and sound awareness. Um, for this order, I'm following common core state standards progression. So this may change depending on what progression you're using. That's the progression that I'm using today. So the first aspect of phonological awareness is word awareness. This means how many words are there in a sentence, if you're able to differentiate the amount of words in a sentence. For example, if I say the dog ran fast, I should be able to know that there are four words in that sentence. And you can practice this with your children by saying a sentence and having them clap how many words are in the sentence. The next part is rhyme recognition during wordplay. And usually when we think of this, we think of nursery rhymes like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, How I Wonder What You Are. Uh, we use nursery rhymes with kids because they're fun, uh, but they're also one of the foundational blocks of uh, reading as well. So playing games with rhymes is a great way to reinforce this and singing nursery uh, songs is great. 
Um, the next part is repetition and creation of alliteration during wordplay. So this just means words that have the same beginning sound. Notice here I'm saying sound, not letter, because at this stage, children aren't using letters yet. They're just uh, working with the sounds. So a fun way to play this is having your child come up with an animal or a food that starts with the same sound as their name. So for example, Kyle Koala or Dominique Dolphin. And you can see how many words you can come up with that start with that same sound. The next part is syllable counting, uh, which means how many syllables are in each word. And in just a minute, I'll show you a video of a game. You can play with that. And the last is onset and rhyme manipulation. Now notice this is rhyme, R-I-M-E. It's different than the other kind of rhyme. Onset means the sound or sounds before the vowel. And rhyme is all the sounds following the vowel. So for example, in the word bag, the onset would be b and the rhyme would be ag. Now for an, uh, another example, flag, there we have two sounds at the onset, fool and ag is the rhyme there. So this is a, a game that you can play in the kitchen to practice syllables and I'll be narrating over this video. I'm narrating the videos today, but uh, the videos will be available for you on, on the website. So basically I've gone to my kitchen and gotten some fruit and I've made a simple, um, a simple percussion instrument. The one I made, all I did was I taped together two cups and put rice inside of it so that I could shake it. You can use any simple percussion instrument. And then what I did was I went through and I counted how many syllables were in each of these fruits. So for example, grapes has one syllable and I can shake it grapes. Grapes, <laughs> there it is. Apple would have two syllables, apple, apple. Lemon would also have two, lemon, lemon. Banana has three, banana, banana. And I'm just shaking as I'm counting the syllables. And watermelon, my favorite of all, has four. Watermelon, watermelon. So this is just a simple game. You can play it using any foods in your kitchen and any simple percussion instrument. So after phonological awareness comes phonemic awareness, which is a more specific type of phonological awareness. Phonemes refer to the individual units of sound in a word. So for children in grades K through two who are developing phonemic awareness, they should be able to identify and isolate uh, phonemes. That can be the beginning, middle, or ending sound of a word. So to uh, have fun with this at home and get your child up and moving around the house, you can play sound scavenger hunt. For younger kids, you can have them sort by beginning sound. So you see my beginning sound here was k. And again, we're working with sounds, not letters yet. And I went around my house and I found a candle, a comb, a cracker, and a cookie. And I sorted them by beginning sound. I was able to isolate the beginning sound k and sort them that way. Uh, with a little bit older children, you can start to sort by ending sound. So you can see at the bottom picture, I went around my house and I found a can, a spoon, a pen, and a napkin, which actually begins and ends with that n sound. So this is a great game to play. Get your kids up and moving around the house. Um, next, uh, we want to be able to blend and segment phonemes. Those are those individual units of sound in a word. So to do this, we can play a game called mystery word. And this is just a word with, this is just a game with our um, sounds. We don't need letters or anything like that. So basically start with a two sound word. So for example, no has two sounds, n, o, and you're going to give it to your child just like that as a mystery word. And you're going to tap it out on your arm, which you'll see in just a second, as you're saying the sounds. Okay. 
Here we go. N o. And that would be the word no. N o. And then see if your child can blend the sounds together, no, into the word no. If they're ready to move on, you can do a three sound word. For example, sh, r, k. Notice I'm counting the sounds, not the letters, because in the word shark, we actually have five letters, but only three sounds, sh, r, k, shark. So you wanna make sure you're picking words with sounds and not so much thinking about the letters at this point. If your child's ready to move on, you can move up to a four sound word like ghost, g -o -st. Then you can have your child be the one to make the mystery word. This is where they get to segment words. So they can come up with their own words and tap it out and segment it for you and then have you solve to guess what their mystery word is. The next part is alphabetic principle, which refers to letter names, the shape of the letters, and the sound that connects to those letters. The order at which your child is taught the letters and the sounds depends on the specific pro uh, phonics program that you're using. Um, contrary to popular belief, these are not usually taught in alphabetical order, like A, B, C, D. They're, they're taught in a systematic order, depending on the particular phonics program that is used at your child's school. So if you wanna know more about that, I recommend reaching out to your child's teacher to determine what the sequence of phonics is that's taught, letter names and sounds that's taught at the school. Um, on RIFT's Literacy Network, I've put together in the Quick Guide section a sound spelling resource, and you can download this resource. It will give you um, all of the sounds or phonemes and their most popular corresponding letter or letter combinations. And another great place to look is if you go to the Common Core website and download Appendix A. So this is a game to uh, reinforce letter names and or you can do it with letter sounds depending on where your child is. So all I've done here is cut up some note cards and written the letters that my child is working on. And then we're going to turn them over. and take turns so you can play this with two people or as many people as you want in your family. And when you turn the card or over, you're going to say, wake up to that letter. So I would say, wake up C, wake up B, wake up J. Or if your child's working on sounds, you can also do the letter sounds. So I might say then, wake up M, mm. wake up K. And kids will get very creative with this. They might say, you know, uh, bonjour or good morning. They, they get very creative with games like this. So if your child's working on a little bit more complex phonics, you can also make sounds with that too. So at the bottom here, I have some different phonic sounds depending on uh, what level your child's working at. So this is a digraph, wake up, shh. Here we have a vowel digraph, wake up A. Here's one of our diphthongs, wake up ow. And wake up er, one of our R controlled vowels. So any level of phonics that, or letter names your child is working on, you can adapt this game. Okay, phonics. So phonics is a very uh, large topic. Um, very popular in the media and research right now. So I don't, we're not going to go over all of phonics today. Today I'm gonna to focus on grades three and up because I don't think we focus enough on phonics for upper grades. So even if you have a younger child, hopefully you can take something from this and be able to uh, apply it to them too. So today, when I'm talking about a consonant, that's a C. And if I'm talking about a vowel, that's going to be represented by a V. And there's long vowels, A, E, I, O, U, and there's short vowels, A, E, I, O, U. 
uh. So if I'm talking about an open vowel, those are going to be long vowel sounds and closed vowels are going to be the short vowel sounds. So this, these are three strategies for chunking longer words for older readers. So the first is the easiest, that's a vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel. And you can see the dash between there because we're going to split it between the two consonants. So, and this is where um, practicing at a younger age, that syllable segmentation is really going to come into play because we're breaking these words into syllables now. So if you look at that first word, napkin, you can see that I've cut the word between the two consonants there and that closes the vowel. So we know it's gonna make an ah sound and it closes also the second vowel. So it's going to make it is sound. So we have nap, kin, and that's one way to break that up. Same thing with the second word, sunny. We're gonna divide it between those two ends, closing the vowel in the word sun, and that means it's going to be a short vowel, sun, me. And same thing with empty. Um, we're gonna divide it between the P and the TY. Y is open, so it's gonna say T, and we have M at the beginning. So that's probably the easiest. The second, a little bit more complicated, is vowel, consonant, vowel and vowel, vowel, consonant, vowel. We're either going to split it uh, before the consonant, making it an open vowel sound, or we're gonna split it after the consonant. 75% of the time, we're going to divide it uh, before the consonant, making it an open vowel sound. So always try this first, and then go on to trying it the other way, because 75% of the time, it's going to be an open vowel. So if you can see my example there, I have even, I only have one consonant, the V. So that means I'm going to divide the vowel before that consonant, making it an open vowel, and it will make the long E sound, E, then. You can see the second part is a closed vowel. It will make that short vowel sound. The second one, meter, same thing. We, we find our E after M, and we see there's only one consonant there. So that means we're gonna cut it before the consonant, making the E an open E, e sound, and it's going to be me and then ter. So if that doesn't work, you read it and the word doesn't make sense, that's when you try divide, uh, dividing it after the consonant. So for example, this word decade, if I did cut it before the C, that would be D and then it would become decade. That's not a word, maybe it didn't make sense in the, in the sentence. So then I'm gonna try it the other way and cut it after the consonant, making that E close. So now it's E, dec, aid. Same thing here for rabid. Um, I try it the first way, rabid didn't make sense. So I'm going to cut it after the consonant, closing that A and making it A, rab, id. So that's the second rule. Um, the last rule for chunking is that consonant blends and digraphs always stick together. So di the digraphs are ch, ch, th, th, or th, wh, and sh, sh, also ph. Um, blends, an example of a blend would be like sp sp in spider or bl bl in blue or at the end of a word like mp in lump. Um, so we're always going to keep those digraphs or blends together. We're not going to cut them between the consonants. So for example, in ether, um, we're not going to cut between the T and the H because we know T and H has to stick together. So we're going to cut it before the TH, making that E open and third to um, close together. Same thing here with spectrum. We see a TR. We know that blends need to stick together, so we're going to cut it between the C and the T, closing that E in there and making it a short E, spectrum. So how might this look when you're working with your kids at home? Very simple. All I did here to decode a multisyllabic word was cut a note card, a little window into a note card, and the word, if you look on the right, is ladle. But my uh, child needs help knowing whether it's an open vowel or a closed vowel. So all I'm gonna do is cover up the second syllable of the word. And now my child has a visual to see, oh, the A is open. That means it's going to be lay. 
and then pull the card over and they can see the end is dull. So very simple way to help your child um, break up the chunk or break up these multisyllabic words. Okay, sight words and high frequency words. Uh, two different things, but a lot of times we use them interchangeably. High frequency words uh, refer to the most commonly occurring words in the English written language. So for example, the, of, and and. And when we think of our youngest readers, kinder, first, and second, their books are, are composed of almost two thirds of the whole book is written uh, of high frequency words. And even for us as adults, about a third of our books or reading materials are made up of these high frequency words. So we really want to um, know these words. It will help us read smoother and quicker. Um, so schools generally use either the fry or the dolch word list for which uh, words they teach. So again, like the phonics, if you don't know which your school program is using, just reach out to your child's teacher and ask them, and then you can easily Google fry list or dolch list, and, there, and there's a lot of them that you can download. Um, sight words are a little bit different. Uh, sight words refer to irregularly spelled words that cannot be decoded phonetically. So all those phonics skills that we just talked about can't be applied to these words because they're irregularly spelled. So these are words like of, was, and from, because if I tried to sound out from, it would be for um, from, it, it wouldn't make sense. So I just need to memorize how that word is spelled and how to read it. Um, you'll notice there's a lot of crossover between high frequency words and sight words, which is why sometimes uh, schools use those terms interchangeably. So here's a multi-sensory activity for teaching and reinforcing sight words. So I have a, what I've done here is I have flour, I've put it on a baking sheet so that it's easier to clean up. You can use any other material, um, sand, salt, sugar. If you wanna get a little bit messier, you can use shave foam or dish soap, anything you want just to make it multi-sensory for your child. And then I've written the words uh, that my child's working on, on these note cards. So the first word is the, and I would have the child read the word and then turn it over. And then they're going to spell it from memory in the uh, flower. We have the, and then you check it and ask them, does your the look like my the? And it does, so great. Um, an important part of this activity is what we call error handling. That's if your child makes a mistake. So here's a common one, T-H-A. So your child's written it T-H-A. The first thing you wanna do is reinforce what they've done well. So you may say something like, great job, you got the T-H in the. Now look, does your the match my the? And they would look at it, so now they're analyzing. And they would say, no, mine has an A and yours has an E. So we need to change that. So then we're going to flip the card over again and just have them change whatever it was that they needed to change. And then flip it back over and ask again, does your the match my the? Okay. So sight words and phonics refer to word reading skills. Now we're moving on to fluency, which is arguably the bridge between word reading and comprehension, because you have to be able to read individual words and you have to comprehend or make meaning to be able to read fluency. I have a, an equation that I like to use for fluency and I say fluency equals rate plus accuracy plus expression. Rate apply, uh, means how fast you're reading it. We don't wanna read too fast or too slow. We want it to read the way that we speak. Accuracy is how many words you're reading correct. For a child to uh, say that the book is independent for them, meaning they can read it on their own without support, you want to have you want them to be able to read between 95 to 96 percent of the words with accuracy or greater. And then expression means are they able to change the intonation of their voice and their prosody to match uh, what the author was intending for the meaning? And here's really where the comprehension component comes in. So if your child is struggling with fluency, there's many different types of uh, fluency 
uh, areas that your child may struggle with. They may sound choppy, robotic. They could be reading too fast, which means they're maybe not, uh, they're skipping over punctuation. They could have inappropriate phrasing or they could be lacking expression. Specifically, if your child's reading sounds choppy or laborious, that usually means the book is too difficult for them. They're taking too long to decode the words or they don't have enough mastery over those sight words, um, that, that it's taking them too long to be able to figure out the word and read fluently. So in that case, the best step is to try an easier book. Um, all the resources that I'm going to share for reading materials for the rest of this presentation are from uh, Reading is Fundamentals COVID-19 resources. So you can access them there. We will share a link with you at the end of this presentation. So one of these resources um, goes with Rift's Beeline Reader. And this um, is part of their health and safety, Chicken Noodle Cures a Cold. And you can see the way that it's written, it's great for practicing fluency because it's written sentence by sentence. So if, you're, if your child needs help with phrasing, it's already phrased for them that they just need to scoop together. I have a cold. Mom always says that chicken soup cures a cold. And you can see my voice went up at the end because there was an exclamation point there. Mom makes soup for me. Mom shows me how to make it. So you can see having it um, parsed out like that helps me to know where to scoop words, especially if your child's been skipping over punctuation. And also you can see the um, color gradient also helps the eye to move along and, and support fluency. Okay, so here's a fluency activity that you can do with uh, mostly with children in the middle grades. So third, fourth, fifth, you could use it as young as uh, second or first even too. Um, so you can use any reading material for this activity. I highly recommend using a poem or a speech because they're a little bit shorter and they're intended to be read aloud. So they make great authentic fluency materials, but any favorite book uh, can be used too. You wanna make sure it's a shorter passage. So maybe just a page from the book or a section if it's a, a chapter book. So the first thing you're going to do is put the reading material between you and your child, or you can use an older sibling for this. Um, and you as the adult or the older sibling are going to read the text to model what good fluency would sound like. The second read, you and the child are going to read the text together. We call this choral reading because it's like a chorus. So you're reading it together at the same time like a chorus. As the adult, you may be reading it slightly faster than the child, that's okay. And then the third time you read it, the child is going to read the text on their own. And you will be amazed how much their fluency increases if you just do an activity like this a few times a week. And then at the end, I love to include some meta metacognition activities. So that's when children reflect on their own learning. So you can ask them, how was your rate? How was your accuracy? How is your expression? And they can think of one area that's a strength for them and one area that they still want to work on. And setting these little goals, um, having your child set their own goals, is a great way to promote independence and uh, reflection on their own learning. OK, fluency for older children. So sometimes our older children, four, fifth, sixth middle school students, don't want to practice their fluency, especially if uh, they are older, maybe they're a little shy or self-conscious about their reading, particularly if fluency is an area that they struggle with. So a great way to support older readers is to listen to audiobooks while following along in the text because they'll hear good fluent reading. Another great way is at the beginning of the week, if you give them a short poem or a speech to practice throughout the week, and then present it to your family at the end of the week. This gives them an authentic audience and an authentic pur purpose for practicing that fluency. And then my favorite is practice reading a children's book. Uh, because children's books are easier than possibly the books that they're reading in, in their grade level, it will give them good opportunities to practice fluency. Now, normally older children might not be interested in reading a children's book. I picked out two here, The Sick Day, and itchy, itchy chicken pox. But 
we can give them an authentic purpose now by saying that they're going to re record a read aloud video for a younger family member, you know, maybe saying to them, your younger cousin is sad, she doesn't get to hear her teacher read or her um, classmates, classmates read, why don't we practice reading this book and then I'll record a video and we can send it to her to cheer her up. So now you've given your older child an authentic audience and purpose and they'll be a lot more invested in practicing their uh, fluency. Okay, vocabulary acquisition. So what is it? Um, why is it important? It's important because early vocabulary knowledge is one of the best predictors of a child's reading comprehension in later years. So the more words you know, the more words you'll, you'll grow. Um, reading aloud to your children is one of the best ways to gain exposure to new words. And when you encounter new words as you're reading aloud with your child, you can stop and take time to discuss what they mean and even try to use the word in a new sentence. Uh, rule of thumb here, uh, it takes about 10 interactions with a new word before a person adopts it into their working vocabulary. So you really need a lot of practice with a new word before you can start to gain, uh, use it in your uh, written, spoken vocabulary. So the way we usually break down words, we have three types of vocabulary words that you may encounter in books. The first is everyday words. These are words that we already are using in our spoken vocabulary, things like happy, table, book, walk, just everyday words. The second is high utility academic words. So examples of this are fret, extraordinary, sprint. They're a little bit more descript descriptive words that we may not use every day. And then the third category is domain specific academic words. So these are ones that you may find in a science speci specific textbook or a social studies or other content area specific textbook. For example, contagious remedies and vaccine. So these are vocabulary activities that you can use with children in all grades. Uh, the book that I'm gonna use as an example today is A Bad Case of the Stripes by David Shannon. And if you go to Literacy Central, Reading is Fundamentals Literacy Central, you can find an educator's guide for this book as well as a read aloud video resource. So even if you don't own this book, you can access a video of somebody else reading this book. So I've picked out um, some high utility words from this book. So those were fret and extraordinary. And I've also picked out some domain specific examples from this book, like contagious and remedies. And again, these are all a part of RIF's COVID-19 section relating to germs and health and safety practices. So when we encounter these words in the book, um, the word fret, let's say, the first thing you're going to do is come up with a child-friendly definition. And you can uh, have your child try to come up with this on their own. Read the word in the sentence, see if there's any clues that help you figure out the word, use the pictures too, and then ask them, what do you think fret means? And they may say something like, to be upset. And then you can draw a picture or act out the word uh, to bring a little bit more meaning to it. Maybe ask them, what would your face look like if you were fretting? and have them make a face. Now they've internalized the word a little bit more. If you have an older child, maybe third grade and up, you can also discuss synonyms and antonyms. So synonyms, words that are similar, could be worry or upset. Antonyms or words that mean the opposite could be to be happy or to be comfortable. And then with your child, create your own sentence using uh, the word fret, or maybe ask them about a time when they, um, we're fretting. And then this is my favorite, to incorporate the word throughout your daily life. Have a competition to see who in your family can find the word in other places like in other books or on TV. So if fret is the word of the week, you, you're going to have a, a fun family competition to see who can hear or find the word fret the most throughout the week. Okay, comprehension. Um, today I'm going to be using Common Core state standards to guide when I talk about comprehension. I recognize that not all states uh, use these. Even if your state isn't using Common Core, 
um, they probably have standards that are pretty comparable to it. So one of the biggest differences of how Common Core has evolved comprehension in schools is that by the end of high school, students should be reading 50% of the time literature books and 40% of the time informational text. So there's a lot more emphasis on informational text uh, because as we're preparing children for college and career readiness, a lot of those college and career readiness texts will be informational texts. Um, just for another guide, by fourth grade, 70% of what children are reading is literature and 30% of informational is informational text. So it, it uh, changes as they, as they move up in grade levels. Um, so to show you how the standards progress, I pulled three of the same strand from kindergarten, third, and sixth grade. So a lot of times when families ask me how they can support their children with comprehension, they'll usually ask me if I have a set of comprehension questions for a specific book. And sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Also, RIF has, as I mentioned before, a lot of educator guides which do have questions. Um, but I wanna show you today how you can come up with your own questions so that you don't have to rely on a comprehension guide for any given text. You can make up your own questions as you're going. And the other thing is, if you look at the kindergarten standard with prompting and support, ask and answer questions about key details in a text. Now we're no longer wanting our children just to be able to answer questions. We also want them to be able to come up with their own questions, which is great because you do not need to rely on a set of questions for a particular text because your child should also be coming up with their own questions as they're reading. Um, looking at how this progresses in third grade, third grade, they also want children to be able to ask and answer questions to demonstrate understanding of a text referring explicitly to the text as the basis for the answers. So this is now wanting them to basically cite text evidence, be able to show you the exact picture or spot in the book where they found the answer to their question. And how this evolves for sixth grade is cite textual evidence to support analysis of what the text says explicitly, as well as inferences drawn from the text. So we hear a lot about that. We don't want just literal understanding of text. We also want children to be able to draw in inferences and we can start this from a very, very young age. Okay, so here's um, a little guide for you, like I said, to be able to come up with your own comprehension uh, for informational text. And I've divided this up into before, during and after. The book that I'm using for this is What Makes You Cough, Sneeze, Burp, Hiccup, Blink, Yawn, Sweat, and Shiver. And this is another one of the resources on uh, RIF's COVID-19 section. Um, so the first thing that you wanna do before reading is what we call activating prior knowledge. So basically what that means is just asking your child what they already know about the topic because we want to recognize and honor the knowledge that our children are bringing with them to the text. So, you know, with a book like this, they may tell you a story about a time that they sneezed or something like that, and that's great. The next thing that you want to do is to take a book walk uh, and look at the text features. What makes informational texts unique is that they have text features, and we want children to start to understand these. So, for example, it may have a table of contents, headings, captions, bolded words, a glossary, or an index. Um, what I like to do is then read the table of contents and generate questions that could be answered just based on the titles of the, of the chapters in the, in the book. So again, that goes back to children coming up with their own questions, not just relying on um, a question set. So for example, in this book, the first chapter is actually called Out of Your Control. So you may change that into a question and say, in that, in that chapter, I think I'm going to learn what is out of your control, maybe how coughing is out of your control. And then later on, when they go to read that chapter, they'll learn that these are called involuntary reflexes. So um, that's before reading. Then we move on to during reading. You wanna make sure that you read each heading um, as you're going, and you can change each heading into a question and then try to answer it as you read. So for example, a, a heading in this book is nerve endings. 
So you, simple way to change that into a question, what are nerve endings? And now you know, as I read that section, I'm trying to answer the question, what are nerve endings? Um, then another important skill is to compare what the text teaches you versus what the images teach you. And we know in informational text, there's different kinds of image. There's photographs, diagrams, sometimes maps. And so we want to talk about what we're learning and where we're getting that information from. Again, if we look at uh, the standards I showed you at the beginning, this is part of citing textual evidence. Where am I getting my answers from? Is it from what the author is telling me in the text or is it from what the illustrator is showing me in the images? And then of course, we're working on our vocabulary. So we wanna look up bolded words in the glossary. And these bolded words in an informational text are most likely going to be those tier three or level three words that are domain specific. So words in this text could be something like involuntary reflexes. And we might wanna look that up in the glossary. After you've read the text, um, you can have a discussion about what you've learned. What did you already know that the text reinforced? What was something new that you learned? What did you find interesting or surprising? Um, and then also acknowledging that we may still have questions. From this book, I might not have learned everything about coughing, and that's okay. We can use this as an opportunity to learn more, and that's a great opportunity to extend into a little mini research project, or maybe you go on the internet and look up more information about coughing. Um, so again, resources for this book, including the pre-reading, reading, and post-reading activities, are all on RIF's COVID-19 section of the website. Okay, so now literature. This specific slide is more geared for our younger readers, grades pre-K, so maybe, maybe ages three and four up through second grade. Um, and this is also from the COVID section relating to social emotional development. Um, we, we are in a very challenging time, and sometimes we might find it challenging to talk to our kids about what's going on in the world. The great thing is uh, children's book authors have already written books with child-friendly language. So you can use these as a bridge to help you talk to your children about COVID-19 or what's going on in the world right now. Um, the other great thing about books like this, uh, a feel better book for little warriors, is that the characters in this book experience big emotions like anxious feelings and there's child friendly language around that too so you can help your child come up with language for what they might be feeling right now. So th same thing, I've organized this into before, during and after for this book. So as a before, similar to informational, you're going to do what we call a picture walk. This is just where you read the title, the back blurb. If it's a chapter book, it will usually have a black back blurb um, and look through some of the pictures. I recommend not going through all of the pictures because sometimes there's a surprise ending that you don't want to um, give up, give away. Um, and then you can ask them. Based on what you've seen so far, based on reading the title, um, make a prediction about what you think the book's going to be about. Now, sometimes children struggle with making predictions and what we do as educators is we model, or sometimes we might call it a think aloud. So you're going to model what, or think aloud how you would make a prediction to show your child what that would look like. So for this one, I might say something like, oh, I see that there's a little girl. Um, she looks like she's inside and looking outside. So maybe she's not allowed to go outside. And it's called a feel better book for little worriers. So maybe she's a worrier. So you can see there, I'm modeling what I'm thinking so that my child has a scaffold for how they might make a prediction in the future. Um, the next part is during. So again, we're going to ask questions while we're reading. Why and how questions will be deeper level than what and who questions. And then make sure you're allowing your child to ask their own questions. Some may be able to be answered and some maybe not. Um, as we spoke, uh, discussed in the vocab acquisition, make sure you pause at any vocabulary words to discuss their meanings or do some of those other activities that we talked about. You can stop and make predictions throughout the book. And then an important skill is making connections to the characters and events. So you may say something like, have you ever felt worried or have you ever felt the way that this, this little girl felt in this book? 
and have them make connections to the story that way. Again, if they're struggling with making connections, you can go back to that think aloud strategy and say something like, I remember I felt worried when, and give them an example to go off of. And then afterwards with literature books, you're going to discuss the author's purpose, theme, or moral. That's mostly for older uh, kids, second grade and up. Um, but even younger kids can discuss uh, the author's message in books. You can reinforce comprehension by acting out the story or, or a scene if it's a longer book. Uh, younger children love rereading their favorite part and discussing why it's their favorite part. Again, we're adding, we're building the skills of citing textual evidence. If we have them go back and show us what is your favorite part and then have them tell us why. So even a pre-K or kindergarten student can already begin to um, cite text evidence and back up their answer. And then for older students, uh, writing an alternative ending or a sequel is a really fun way to engage them um, to extend their comprehension as well. And that is all. Thank you so much, Erin, for sharing your expertise with us today. We really appreciate you taking that time. Um, I'd now like to take just a few minutes to highlight some great RIF resources to use at home. Erin highlighted um, a few of them throughout her um, uh, presentation today, but we'd like to kind of show you the links and where to find these resources. So here we have RIF's new Virus and Germ Center. Um, this center was accessible, or this center accessible by visiting the URL displayed on the screen was specifically created to talk to children about germs and viruses through the suggested reading materials. In addition to those suggested reading lists, you will find various activities for your children, including puzzles, uh, coloring sheets, reading passages, and more. And another great resource uh, for at-home use is RIF Skybury service. Uh, Skybury offers almost 1,000 eBooks across many topics and genres to engage and excite young readers. You'll also find hundreds of video field trips hosted by LeVar Burton to take children on adventures from the comfort of your home. Every book offers uh, the option of read to me narration to support newer struggling readers as well. And if you're interested in checking out the service, RIF offers a 30 day free trial um, for consumers. And you can sign up for that free trial by visiting that link shown on the screen, riff.org slash skybrary. And again, those are just a couple of resources that we have, um, but feel free to peruse the website, the RIF uh, platform to, to check out additional free resources as well. So we'll now move into the Q&A portion of the presentation. And if you have any questions, we will invite you to take some time uh, to put those into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, again, we'll give you just a few minutes to input your questions before I start um, sharing those with Aaron. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start the Q&A, but again, keep um, putting any questions you have into that question box. So we have a, a great question um, mm -hmm. on sight words. Um, how can we help younger students memorize sight words? My students tend to try decoding them anytime they come across one? Great question. I love that question. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is make sure that students understand some words. It's great that you want to decode the words, but some words we just can't decode. And I like to call those words oddballs. They're just oddballs. Or another great way to phrase that with your students is saying they don't play by the rules. Um, so we can say those are oddball words or they don't play by the rules. And that at least helps students understand that there are some words out there that we cannot decode. Um, and then if you go back to the um, thinking about the uh, activity that I showed you with the flower, the great thing about that activity, since it's multi-sensory, is it's going to help students then connect those letter shapes to the word in their mind. Because what we're doing is we're not so much connecting with the sound since we're not sounding it out and decoding it. We're more so focused on the shape of the word. 
and memorizing the whole word versus the individual sounds in the word and connecting it with the shape of the word. So any multi-sensory activities with sight words are helpful for children memorizing them, as you said. Um, another question here, how can I coach students around accuracy through an online platform? I tend to notice that sometimes it takes us a long time if we choir, if we're choir reading. Oh, I see, with accuracy. Okay, yeah, so definitely if you're using choral reading, you're mo more so focused on the rate and the expression over the accuracy because as you've noticed, um, with choral reading, everyone's reading it at once. So if one child makes a mistake in their accuracy, you may not even notice it because the other children are reading at the same time. So again, if you model read the passage first, then you've already modeled all of the words read accurately, and the second read through would be more focused on um, the, the aspects of rate and expression. Um, for accuracy, if they do miss a word, you can always reflect on that and go back and use one of those decoding strategies to figure out what that word was. But yes, it is very hard with choral reading because there the emphasis is more on the rate and expression over decoding the word in terms of accuracy. Great. Um, we have a few people that ask questions about your videos. They loved them and they would love to be able to share them with their families. I just want to note that we will share those um, out after this presentation. So we'll share not only the recording of this webinar, but we'll share the PDF slides as well um, so that you can have access to everything that Erin shared today. I just wanted to note that real quick. Absolutely. Um, how can we uh, get students to pronounce words when it is a language issue? So you're thinking if they learned phonics in their own language, I'll use Spanish as the example, and then now they're trying to decode it in their own language. Um, it may, even for older kids, you may actually have to go back and reteach them all of the sounds, starting with the single letter sounds and all the way up through the vowel, vowel digraphs, digraphs, and diphthongs. And again, if you go to um, the RIF uh, Literacy Central, I do have a resource on there with all of the pho English phonemes and the corresponding graphemes, most common, and that would be a great resource to give to families as well if they need to learn how to pronounce those specific phonemes but that's more of a, a pronunciation learning those english phonemes and then matching it to the graphemes or the letters and letter combinations great um, we have an, another few questions about credit given so i just want to note that the go to webinar panel um, after the presentation it will automatically send all participants a, um, a certificate of attendance and so it's really just up to your your school or your organization to award that credit but it will generate a certificate for you for attending today um, and then we have just a couple minutes so if there's any additional questions um, feel free to put those into the question box now great questions thank you everyone all right I don't see any additional questions. I'll just give it one more minute. And again, yes, we will share uh, the slides after the presentation today. Um, and I think that's it. We're just getting a lot of people thanking you, Erin, and we are certainly grateful for your time today. Um, so we'll just go ahead and wrap up. Oh, and we had someone ask if they can share these slides. Um, yes, feel free to share with um, your fellow teachers or coworkers or your families that you're working with. Um, that's completely fine. Um, but we do have one more question that came in. How many words should be taught at a time? I'm thinking you're meaning for sight words. For the younger kids kindergarten, I usually uh, teach around five or six per week, not too many, um, because Kindergarten typically 
learns between 50 to 100 of those sight words per year. If you're a teacher, you can kind of think about when you want to start teaching those words. For kindergarten, it may be mid-year, and then just divide the amount of weeks that you have left in school by how many words the uh, kids are expected to master by the end of the year. Again, that will vary a little bit uh, school to school, but I've always found that about five words per week for younger learners is manageable. Great. Thank you so much. And that is I think all we have time for as far as questions today. Um, so I'm just gonna wrap us up. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Please feel free to, like I said, look over the RIF resources at RIF.org. Um, many of those resources we mentioned um, are accessible from our Literacy Central platform and that link is on the screen for you right now. Um, and then feel free to contact the RIF community team at literacy network at RIF.org. If you have any questions or comments on the presentation, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and again, thank you so much for today. Thank you.